Good evening, everyone. We're reading tonight from 1 Kings in chapter 17. And beginning in verse 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. And beginning in verse 17. Father, speak now very plainly, very clearly, and very powerfully, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Are you come to me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? You remember the story up to this point. God has sent... Elijah to the woman. The woman was living in the midst of the land that was beset by this famine uh, that was put or came into existence because Elijah had prayed that there would be no rain. And so for all of this time, she had been going around, and as, as the ground had dried up, as the resources had gone away, Elijah found her when she was out. We saw this last night. She was out looking for two sticks to build a little fire so that she could take a little bit of oil and a little bit of meal and make the last two cakes. And then she and her son was going to die. But then here comes Elijah. And Elijah was to the woman at this point in her story the same thing that the brook was to Elijah in his story. Oh, remember? Elijah had run. He had no shelter. He had no one to harbor him. And so God had said, Elijah, go and run to the brook Cherith, and I will command it. I've commanded some ravens to sustain you there. And so Elijah runs to this place, and he is being kept by the mercies and providence of God by some stingy birds and a brook that eventually dried up. And so very like the woman, or very like Elijah, the woman has now been in a situation where all of her stuff has gone away because of the famine. But when Elijah comes, it is almost as if Elijah is the woman's brook and her raven. And day after day after day, night after night after night, that barrel of flour, that uh, cruise of oil, it does not run dry because she has done what God has commanded her to do. So imagine how she must have felt then that day when she woke up and she found her baby boy so very sick. And we don't know how long it took, but eventually the Bible says that she took him up and there was found no breath in him. In other words, he was dead. Now, note the significance of her son dying. The woman is not married to Elijah. Elijah is not her hubby. Elijah is not her provider. Elijah is not going to be there forever. She is a widow woman. A widow woman does not have, in that society, she's not going to work like everybody else can work. She's not going to plow the field like everybody else plows the field. Her only source of future sustenance is her son. 
He's the one that's going to go out at the age of 11, 12 years old and go and work to be able to sustain and maintain the household. He is the one that God has given her that she knows is going to be her future. And, and now she wakes up and the little boy is dead. Can you imagine what's going through her mind now? She's looking at Elijah like, I know you. You ain't going to be here forever. I know you're just passing through. But this, this child was mine. And not just, it wasn't just a selfish thing either. Not just about her future. It was about him. This was her baby boy. And now, He's dead. Interesting scenario that is presented here. Elijah knows what this feels like to a certain degree. Why? Because Elijah knows what it feels like to have a brook dry up. And so all that God had been leading Elijah through, the same abandonment that he may have felt when God had sent him to the brook and the brook dried up, he understood now that this was the same abandonment that the woman was feeling that God had left her in. Why did God send Elijah to the brook that dried up? Because he knew that Elijah was going to come and was going to meet this woman. And he said, Elijah, when you minister to this woman. I don't need you to minister to her in something that you don't understand. I need you to be able to have an experience so that not only can you sympathize, but you can empathize. You know what empathy is, right? Sympathy is when you just feel bad for a circumstance that somebody else is going through. Empathy is when you've been there. When you know what it feels like to lose a loved one and you see somebody else going through it, you know that there might not necessarily be any words to say, but just to be there and put your arm around. You know, there's a lot of things that members think that pastors can't empathize with folk about. You know what I empathize with a lot of folk with? I know what it feels like to be hungry at 2 a.m. in the morning. I know what it's like to, to have some apple turnovers and some uh, vegan ice cream in the freezer at 2 a.m. And for those of you that struggle with, with the diet, have, I know what that feels like. We could go on, but God had put Elijah in a situation, had taken him to the brook and removed him from the brook so that now when he meets the woman, he has empathy for her and can minister to her. So that stuff that you've been going through, when your brook dried up, hey, God is preparing you to be able to meet your widow woman and to be able to minister her, not from just somebody on the fringes who says, I can only imagine what it feels like. God is taking, remember Abraham? Abraham went up on Mount Moriah and Abraham took his son, his only son. You remember what God said to him? Abraham, take your son. And then he rubbed it in. Your only son. He didn't stop there. The son that you love. And take him up on Mount Moriah. And offer him as a burnt sacrifice. Why? Because God had put his hand on Abraham. 
and said, Abraham, you are going to be the father of a nation that's got to go and tell the story of the gospel. Well, what's the gospel story? The gospel story is the story about a father who was about, who was about to sacrifice his only son and watch this up on that same mountain. In Abraham's time, it was called Moriah, but 2,000 years later, it was called Calvary. And so he was preparing Abraham the same way he had prepared Elijah, the same way he is preparing you going through some of your stuff to be able to find somebody and to be able to say, not only do I know, watch this now, not only do I know what it feels like to be strung out on drugs, not only do I know what it feels like to be addicted to alcohol, but you know what else I know? I know what it feels like to be delivered. I know what it feels like to gain the victory. I know what it feels like to have a breakthrough. And so God is preparing you in the midst of your situation for a situation just like this. But here's another interesting part of the story that I want to spend a few minutes dealing with. Can you imagine what happens now to the little boy? There is a teaching that is pervasive today throughout Christianity that would make the story go a little bit like this. The little boy dies. By the way, it is not a biblical teaching, but it's somehow taught as that. But the little boy dies, and, and, and this particular teaching that has, has made its way from paganism and, and into the, the heart of Christianity, it says that as soon, and it's been really been baptized into Christianity and, and put some Christian trappings around it. But, but the story would go like this, that as, as soon as the little boy's breath left him, that now all of a sudden, immediately, he would open his eyes, he would wake up, and there standing in front of him, St. Peter. And St. Peter is standing there in front of the little boy, and he's saying, little boy, I'm so sorry that, that you died. I'm so sorry that you went through all that you went through, but I'm so glad that you lived such a wonderful life. I am here, says St. Peter to the little boy, to welcome you into the gates of glory. And the little boy looks up and he sees, and this is what he sees, this is what this teacher, he sees heaven. There'll be something special to see heaven. Well, this is what he's going to see. He would see, he would look up and he would see a city that was as far this way as it was far in that way. And just as far as it was this way, it was as tall this way. The Bible says, John says he saw it, and it was a city that lies four square. And when John saw the city, as he was describing it in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, chapter 21, he goes and he says that I saw the walls of the city, and the walls of the city were made of pure jasper. And when I looked at the walls of the city, they were so pure jasper that I could see through them. They were transparent. And he also says that the city itself was, was, was made of pure gold, but it was so pure it was like transparent glass. And then John says, and this is what the little boy would be saying, that the city had 12 foundations, and each one of those foundations was a precious emerald, a precious stone. I read through that thing just before we got up tonight, and I can't even pronounce, I haven't even seen or heard of all of these things. Amethyst and, and jacinth, I ain't never seen them. But the Bible says that heaven, you're going to have that 12 foundations of all of those, all of those precious stones. And then John said, you know what else I saw? I saw the gates to the city. And there are 12 gates to this city. And he says that each one of these gates is made out of a single pearl. I've seen pearls before and they fit around somebody's neck. But we're told that, 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 that Adam is going to enter into the city. And Adam was at least, I told you the other night, that if I met Adam in that resurrection one, I'm going to be staring at Adam in his kneecap. I, I can't see Adam, well, that this pearl has got to be so, in the words of our president, huge. All around the city. And then 
we're told that, that the little boy, we're not we're told, but this way that, that the little boy would begin to enter into the gates of the city and up ahead of him he would see the throne of God. And out from underneath the throne of God comes this river of life. It is a pure crystal river. And can you imagine the wonder and the awe that that little boy would be experiencing now as he sees this river? Why? Because he just came from a place where there had been no rain. It had been dry. There was a famine. There was nothing. But he sees this river and he sees all kind of fish and all kind of dolphins and whales and killer whales and sharks and, and it's like, whoa. Then he sees this tree. And this tree is called the tree of life. And, and as we look at the tree or we talk about the tree, the Bible talks about it. And, and, and one Bible writer talks about the idea that the tree of life has a, a trunk on either side of the river and that the river flows neath it, and that on this tree of life, the leaves are for the healing of the nations. And it bears 12 manner of fruit, each different, different fruit every month. And the little boy is just looking around this awesome city, and whoa. Isaiah says that in this earth may do, in this heavenly city, that the lion, is going to lay down with the lamb. The little boy is walking around the city and he walks up and he sees a nice little lamb and he wants to go over and pet it and then all of a sudden, woof, big old lion just comes and jumps and starts playing with the lamb. And the little boy starts playing with the lion and the lamb. Now if it's me, the lion and the lamb is gonna be nice, but Jose, you know I like scuba dive. And I wanna to get to that sea of glass. And if I was like that little boy, I'd be waiting to get into that sea of glass and to go to, to jump in there and without a scuba tank, be able to swim around with killer whales and, and, and see all of the manner of colors of fish and, and all of that stuff. And can you imagine that the little boy is having a blast up in heaven? But that's not all. Jesus said in John chapter 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Then he said this, in my father's house are many mansions. And if I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And so not only does the little boy get to tramp around and, and see all of the wonders of the glory of heaven, glories of heaven, he also is finally ushered to a house that has been custom made by the hand of God just for him. And everything that that little boy had, had ever imagined his own. You ever imagined your own house? You ever wanted to build your own house? You ever want to do that? I know I have. I've thought about it. I've thought about exactly how I want to build my own place. And I've thought, I want to do this. I want to have this here. You know, the little boy had probably done that too. Probably at some point when he was living, he'd seen somebody's house that was bigger and better than his. And he said, man, I want to do that one day. And if he had ever heard the stories of heaven, he knew that at some point, one day, God was going to build a house that was just a mansion that was just for him. And you know what God knew? Here's the beauty of what God knew. God knew exactly what was in the little boy's mind. And when God began building his mansion, the Bible says this, I hath not seen ear hath not heard nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for his children and so when the little boy would have been ushered into his own home it would have been exactly what he wanted and some and he's just hanging out in his own custom made crib built by God's own hand Oh, that would have been wonderful. That would have been nice. Except in the story, Elijah goes and messes it all up. Elijah, come on, man. Look, 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 look what Elijah does. 
In verse 19 of chapter 17, the Bible says, And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom, the dead boy, and carried him up into a loft where he abode. And he laid the boy down on his own bed. He carried him up, took the boy, and he laid him down on his own bed. And then the Bible says, and he took the boy, uh, uh, and he cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child <laughs> three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray thee. Let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Wait a minute. Back up in glory. This is Gabriel paging the little boy, paging the little boy. You are needed at the front gate. Please return immediately to the front gate. There's been a mistake. What in the world? The little boy is just getting ready to, to get into it. He's getting ready to get into something else. That he's just long. And, sorry, buddy. We got to send you back. I gotta go back, back down there where there's the famine. Wait, wait, wait! You know the boy was probably was probably just sitting down, was just sitting down to that great big old welcome table. He probably had a great big mango he had just peeled, and and there was some watermelon that was off to the side, and and there was some some grapes that were the size of of, of cantaloupes that were sitting there, and he was just getting. Now I gotta go back down there. And there's a, it's a famine, no, the famine is still there. What? That would make a horrible story for that little boy, wouldn't it? But I am glad, she said Stephen King. <laughs> I am so glad that that's not what the Bible teaches about what happens when you die. The Bible teaches this. When we go to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and I want to begin reading in verse 4. Take your Bibles if you've got them or your devices and turn with me there to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And I want to clear this up because in so many areas in in so many places uh, there's confusion about what happens and when what happens when we die Ecclesiastes chapter 9 you're familiar with the text many of you and the Bible says this for to him that is joined beginning in verse 4 Ecclesiastes chapter 9 beginning in verse 4 for to him that is joined unto the living there is hope look at somebody and say hope, hope. for a living dog is better than a dead lion. A living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know what? Not anything. Now watch this. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither, somebody ought to say amen to this, neither, anybody that believes in ghosts ought to say amen to this, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Somebody say amen. There's no haunted houses. Listen, if somebody's going to be mad at you now, get it all out now. If you want to get at somebody and mess somebody else's life up now, do it now. Because when you are dead, you have no opportunity to come back and mess with them once you die. Because the Bible says, neither, if you're going to fight somebody, fight them now. 
Tell you what, but on the, if you're going to love somebody, love them now. Because the Bible says that once you're dead, you're dead. And you have no more forever anything to do with anything that's going on under the sun. Listen, listen, listen. There are folk that I've talked to and folk that we've heard of that, that grandma died, died 15 years ago. And grandma came back, stood at the foot of their bed and said, nine, seven, six, five, four, two, one, eight. That's the numbers, the Powerball. <laughs> Go and write it down, and you're going to win the Powerball lottery. Grandma, as much as she loves you, as much as she should have put it in her will. Because Grandma, according to the word of God, has no more anything to do with anything once she's dead. She can't love you, nor can she hate you. You didn't have that car accident because Uncle Ray Ray came in the midst of your car and said, boo. <laughs> Why? Because Uncle Ray Ray is dead. She said, Ray, Ray, and Pookie and them. None of them. None of them going to be able to come back. Also, their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Now watch this, Job, Job. Now this is not a new Christian teaching. You know why I know this? Because the earliest Christian book that was ever written is the book of Job. And in the book of Job, we find this in chapter 14. Go with me, book of Job, chapter 14. Job begins talking about this and he says, for there is verse 7, Job chapter 14. I'm going to begin reading in verse 7. Job chapter 14 and verse 7. For there is hope of a tree, if the tree be cut down, that it will sprout again. And that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and will bring forth balls like a plant. But, see you kill the tree, cut the tree down, the tree will go back. But Job says, but a man dies and wasteth away. Yes, the man gives up the ghost. And where is he? Yeah, that's the question, right? The little boy. When he died, in that time between when she handed him to Elijah, and Elijah took him up the stairs and, and, and laid and stretched himself over the boy and prayed. Where was the boy during that time? What was going on with him? Gave up the ghost and the water. The Bible says this. He gave, man gives up the ghost and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and dryeth up, so man lieth down and riseth not till the, when? Heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Casper! <laughs> Casper doesn't exist <laughs> because when you're dead you're dead until the heavens be no more then watch what Job said later on in verse 13 he says oh talking to God oh that you would hide me where in the grave and that you would keep me secret until your wrath be passed. And that you would appoint me a set time. And that you would remember me. If a man die, 
shall he live again all the days of my appointed time will I what does he say I will wait until my change come you shall call and I will answer thee you will have a desire to look on the work of your hands in other words when you die you rest in the ground you wait until God calls you well when is that gonna happen go with me to the book of Daniel when is he going to do that? The book of Daniel. Daniel talks about it. Daniel chapter 12. The book of Daniel. Daniel begins chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up. What time is this? This is at the very end of time when it's all over. There's been this great time of trouble he's getting ready to talk about. And the great prince which standeth for your people and the children of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now watch verse 2. And many of them that do what? Sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to what? Everlasting life and some to everlasting sh uh, contempt. Shame and everlasting contempt. There is coming a time and it ain't here yet. That time of trouble such as never was. We've had some times of trouble but Bible is saying we ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to be after that time of trouble that rocks this earth after that time he says many in the graves shall awake when's that going to be it's going to be on resurrection morning and Revelation chapter 19 talks about that when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a resurrection, a first resurrection. And those that rise in the first resurrection are going to meet the Lord in the air. The Bible writer Paul talks about it in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. Take your Bibles, turn with me there. 2 Thessalonians, again, you know this one, 2 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want to begin reading. And Paul is trying to explain this thing because he wants to make sure that you understand it. And he says this. But I, and he, he makes it clear. And I would, starting in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and beginning in verse 13, Paul says, But I would not have you to be ignorant. Brethren, concerning them which are what? And if you're asleep, you're waiting. I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as those others, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, I want you to understand how this reads. How this reads in the King James Version has led many to kind of twist the picture. But remember, it doesn't work because if they're sleeping, the Bible says that then in Daniel that they're going to rise from where? The dust, they that sleep in the dust. Some of them are going to rise. So when it says, even them will God bring with him, he's not saying that when he comes back, he's going to bring them with him. He's saying that once he comes back and raises them from the dead, then he's going to bring them with him back to heaven. Even so, will the, uh, also with sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. What is that saying? When Jesus comes back to take the saints back to glory, he's saying that those who are alive when he comes, we're not going to get there before those who are asleep. Why? Well, he begins to unpack it and to explain it as we keep reading. 
Go on. He says this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise last. Okay, you're paying attention. You're paying attention. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then what else? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up how? Together. That when we get to glory, that little boy isn't walking around in heaven before I get there. He's got to wait for me. Why? Because God says we're going to get caught up together that we're going to get to explore the unseen untold unimagined glories of heaven with all of our loved ones we're going to get to explore it together even if grandma died 10 5 uh, 15 50 years ago me and grandma gonna get to walk on those streets of gold together she's going to explore when she says "Ooh," i'm gonna say ah we're going to see it and experience it together, God says. Then we that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Come play for me, Sheila. So, if I die young, I'm going to get there the same time as everybody else. If I die old, I'm going to get there the same time as everybody else. If I die young, I don't have to get up in the glory and watch my little brothers and sisters down on earth acting the fool, cutting up, getting into all kind of mischief. <laughs> you know, some of y'all, some of y'all, some of us, some jealous folk, aren't we? Can you imagine what it'd be like, Sister Shettlesworth? You die, and you get to glory, and you got to watch Brother Shettlesworth go and find himself another woman. <laughs> Baby, can you imagine that? If you had to watch, God says, I got that. I got, I got you covered. I got that. I'm going to let you sleep. <laughs> I'm going to let you wait through it all. Those kids that you put all that time into, all that effort, all that money into sending them to church school and bringing them to Pathfinders and Sabbath school, and you happen to die and then got to watch them from heaven running the streets, getting into all kind of trouble, can't do nothing about it. God says, I got that. I'm not going to make you have to watch that because that would turn your heaven into your hell. Says, I'm going to let you sleep and rest through that thing. And then I'm going to work on them. I'm not going to leave them alone. I'm going to still do everything that I can to make sure that they get to know me for who I am. So that on resurrection morning, when that celestial trumpet blows, when the whole earth is filled with the glory of God, and, and, and when the voice of God, that shout rings throughout the earth, when the trump of God shall sound, says, I will have done everything that is possible to be done to make sure that when the saints of God are raised from sleeping grace, that those who are alive and remain, that we're going to be able to be caught up together.
that little boy when Elijah stretched out over him he hadn't been to heaven I'll say this nor had he been to hell where had he been sleeping sleeping the sleep of death Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says that when you die that dust is going to return to dust. And he says the spirit which is essentially the breath that God breathed into humanity. In Genesis chapter 2 the Bible says that God bent over a lump of clay that, that he breathed into the dust. He breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. In other words, he didn't say that you had a soul. He said that you became a soul. And that same word soul that is translated there, same word translated spirit in Ecclesiastes, the breath will return to God which gave it. When the little boy died, his body at that very moment began decomposing spirit or his breath had been returning returned to God it said there was no breath in him well where did his breath go it was the breath of God that gives life but when Elijah prayed the breath didn't know nothing because the breath was just a breath it was God's breath but when Elijah prayed it was the same God who breathed into Adam that initial breath of life that said, I'm going to allow that breath to return back into that little boy. And he gave you and I a picture of what it's going to be like on resurrection morning. When eyes that have not moved, ears that have not heard, hands that have not moved, when the breath of God returns into inanimate dust and it reconnects and then it's going to be like the bones that Ezekiel saw in that valley where the foot bone going to connect to the ankle bone and the ankle bone is going to connect to a leg bone and the leg bone is going to connect to a, a knee bone and the knee bone is going to connect to a thigh bone and the thigh bone is going to connect to a, a hip bone and the hip bone is going to connect to a, a backbone and the backbone is going to connect to a shoulder bone and the shoulder bone is going to connect to a, a neck bone and the neck bone is going to connect to a, a head bone and, and God's going to rebreathe his breath and animate that thing and you and I if we're faithful will be raised to life should we die before he comes if he could do it for the little boy. He can do it for you. He can do it for me. But here's the thing. There's not a single man, woman, boy, or girl who's going to be raised in that first resurrection except they have given themselves my body, mind, and spirit, wholly, unreservedly into his hands. Remember, Daniel said that there's going to be a resurrection of them that sleep in the graves, and some everybody's going to get resurrected. Some to eternal life, but some to shame and everlasting destruction. And you don't get to choose then which one you're going to be in. But you do get to choose now. You do get to choose today. Now is the acceptable time. Today if you hear God's voice. Now is the time. Paul says it is high time to awake out of sleep and to make your calling and election sure with him right now this very moment if that's your desire with me tonight I'm going to ask that you would stand with me Heavenly Father tonight we are convinced by the truth of your word that there will be a 
resurrection of the dead one day and there's going to be two of them you said in your word there's going to be a resurrection to everlasting life and then Lord there's also going to be another resurrection it's going to be into shame and everlasting contempt there's going to be some that are saved and there's going to be some that are lost there's going to be some that you're going to extend your hands and say enter into the joy of the Lord and, and there's going to be another class that you're going to say depart from me I never knew you and Father, what happens on that day is dependent upon what's happening right now. For in somebody's mind and in somebody's heart, you have been wrestling and, and you have been fighting and, and you have been struggling, begging, pleading, prompting, saying, look, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And you've been presenting before somebody today. This is life. This is death. You said, I have set before you blessing and cursing. I have set before you life and death. And you said, choose life. Somebody here tonight, somebody here tonight has been wrestling with God over whether you're going to choose the way that you know he is leading, the way that you know he is pushing. But you've been fighting. You've been wrestling. And Father, you know who that is. You know who that individual is. You know who those individuals are. Tonight, tonight, Father, we are praying that the God who could breathe life back into a dead little boy can come into this building tonight and breathe life into a dead spiritual soul. Place your mouth upon their nostrils and breathe into them your spirit so that they might have life tonight and life more abundantly. Father, we're all asking for that in some way, in some form, in some degree. But Father, we know that you're able. Do it for us. Do it for us. We must have you do it. Or we perish. We're counting on you. We're trusting in you. Do it. Do it for us. Do it now. Because we ask it in Jesus' name that everybody say amen and amen.